Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Apostolov, for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, before I get going, uh, I just let me say a few words of introduction. My name is Nick Milner. I'm a director of Thomas Miller, which is the manager of the UK P&I Club and the UK Defence Clubs. I've been working on claims in our Piraeus office since 1999. Thomas Miller also manages a host of other mutuals, the best known of which in the transport sector and down here in Greece are the Hellenic War Risk Club and the Through Transport Mutual, the TT Club. Alongside these transport mutuals we also run other mutual insurers and businesses in areas as diverse as professional indemnity after the event legal costs and fund management. For our purposes today, however, we're focusing on the UK P&I Club's function as an insurer of ship owners' liability to third parties, and we'll be drawing from our experience in container ship cargo claims. We've all seen containers, whether on the back of a truck, while looking out of the window while driving past a port like Piraeus, or out to sea. Many of you in this room will have served on ships which handled and carried them. Growing up in London myself, before practicing as a barrister, I didn't have much opportunity to acquire hands-on experience of containers until fairly late. My first close-up encounter with a container came when I had a holiday job, funnily enough. Uh, as a student 20 years ago, I worked as a warehouse assistant for a friend's father who had a clothing business in Highbury. Over the course of the summer, I spent many a shift unpacking sweater coats from the containers shipped in from Turkey for distribution to UK department stores all around the country and ultimately to the backs of many an old lady around Britain. We hardly saw a problem with the contents of those containers and in reality it's a fact that well below 1% of containerised shipments encounter problems. It's an incredibly efficient way to move goods. As a result of this, of course, the last 20 years have witnessed a dramatic increase in container movements by sea. New terminals and hubs proliferate around the world. Container ships have also grown. We now have ULCVs like the Edith Maersk and her sisters carrying close to 15,000 TEU when laden. In fact, I'm told that the sky would be the limit if it were not for the Malacca Straits which ship designers say serve as a natural limit for container ship draft and beam. So who knows? Maybe I'll find myself 20 years from now standing in front of an audience talking about ships known as Malacca Maxes. Well, maybe not in Greece, of course. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about claims, shall we? The UK club has, since I was a student, been analysing its larger claims. We consider that to be claims that are above 100,000 uh, US dollars in total, including the fees and costs involved. Data from those claims is used to spot trends and areas of concern, as well as improvements. The exercise helps us prevent future loss and therefore assist what is a very important function of a P&I club. It's a very valuable process. I've limited my talk today to these areas here. Um, I can read, see the slide, okay. Um, I hope, that, so sorry if that doesn't cover everything, but time is apparently tight. Uh, but if, everyone, if anyone here is allergic to statistics, please let me know. I will be flashing up a few charts and graphs. Uh, you've been warned. Before moving on to the next slide, and just to set the scene, I'd like you to focus your minds on world trade for a moment. I've got two questions. How many containers do you think there are out there in circulation? And the other one is how many loaded container movements do you think there are every year? These are the answers. This gives us an idea of the potential for problems to occur. 18 million containers in circulation, more than 100 million loaded container movements a year. The TT Club, by the way, uh, ensures 40% of those containers. I'm going to take you th through some of our data 
on container ship claims. There are over 400 container ships entered in the UK club. That forms 12% of the entry in tonnage terms. Container ship claims, in terms of number, account for only 10% of all our large claims. So you'll note that 10% is well behind bulk, dry cargo, passenger and of course tankers. Looking at the same data in terms of value, you'll see that container ships large claims record improves, with the 12% entry accounting for only 9% of the claims in total value terms. Whereas the opposite can be said of tankers, which you'll note generate 20% of the large claims in value, 28% rather, <laughs> large claims in value terms, even though they have only, as we've seen, 16% of the total number of claims. What type of claims do container ships have? This graph shows that the cargo claims account for just shy of 55% of all container ship claims. That's the red column all the way on the left. The blue column next to it tells us that approximately one-third of all container ship claims in terms of value arise from the cargo. Set against the club's benchmark for frequency of claims, container ship claims are well above 38%, which is what we see for all classes of entered ship. This suggests to us that there is room for improvement. On the plus side, uh, looking at crew claims, which is the next one along, it's 19% in the red column, whereas for the club across the board, we usually have a frequency of 30% of claims that are crew related. So let's look at the number one area. We don't really have the time to look at all the others. So the next few slides taken together reveal some truths about the causes of these claims. About half, you'll see from the pie chart, about half of the large container cargo claims are caused by someone ashore, as opposed, for example, to only one-sixth being the fault of a deck officer. And if we look at where the damage occurs, our data tells us that one-third of the cargo claim incidents don't even occur on board with more than one half of those, or basically one sixth of all large cargo claims, arising, arising outside the port limits. Here's another graph, uh, shore person contributory cause. If we drill down into our data for those claims predominantly caused by shore person error, we become aware that those losses can be attributed to one of five sources in the main. So over on the left hand side, I don't know if you can read all the, the writing at the bottom, the five areas are basically, our big five, bad stowage, bad handling, the wrong temperature settings, particularly with reefers of course, terminal error, and fraud or crime. And the other areas are, are uh, less significant. Looking at type of damage, what types of damage do we see? Physical damage is the winner here, both in terms of frequency and value. Just take a look though at how, although it's behind wet damage, which is at the top, and theft in frequency terms, containers lost overboard account for over 15% of the claims in terms of value, putting them, those claims, in second place. I'm going to look at those two areas uh, as well as uh, from, from now on, so please bear with me. There'll be more photographs and less graphs, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> physical damage first. What causes do we have for physical damage? mainly bad stowage, both within the container itself and also on how it's placed on board the ship. 
equally pure securing practice when the container is stuffed and once loaded and stowed are prevalent. Packaging is also uh, an important factor and that shouldn't be forgotten. But again, that's not for the ship owner to concern him with. Let me give you some il illustrations of physical damage. Internal bad stowage. How well did the shippers stow the cargo inside the container? This is obviously crucial. There are guidelines for good container stuffing practice uh, and this club certainly has produced some useful material for shippers in this respect. Here we have a picture of a steel coil inside a container, uh, stowed inside a regular 20 foot container, but not on a reinforced flat. Simple thing. Sometimes the poor stowage is external. Okay, these may be empty containers, but believe me, it does happen with laden containers too. You'll see there that 7% of the containers on the MSC Napoli were found to be in the wrong position. That was the uh, 62,000 GRT container ship, which in 2007 suffered structural damage in storms off the Cornish coast in England. She had to be towed to Portland in Dorset for salvage, but due to persistent bad weather and being about to sink, the decision was taken to beach the vessel on, on, on a nearby beach. Uh, hundreds of tons of leak, leaked oil went into the sea and an operation was put into place to transfer the vessel's heavy fuel to other ships. She also started to shed some of her $65 million cargo, which included industrial and agricultural chemicals. After the Torrey Canyon incident, it's the second most expensive salvage claim in UK history. I'll come back to it a bit later. So the ship may stow cargo badly, but we're not the worst. <laughs> Poor securing of cargo within a container is another cause of physical damage. And as you can see, not just to the cargo itself, but also to the container as well. Care has to be taken to ensure that the cargo will not shift during sea passage, which is sure to be uh, subjecting the container to pitching, rolling and heaving. Any rough weather at all in this instance, and the contents of this container would be rattling all over the place. Securing the containers, an external issue, is obviously very important as well. Uh, twist locks are the traditional way of, of doing that. Um, unfortunately, our experience tells us that there are still instances where the boxes are not securely fixed. Simple things, again. Twist locks continue to cause confusion. They have to be in a good condition, of course. Uh, they have to close uniformly. We shouldn't have rogue locks which look closed when they're in fact open. As you can see on the right, there are, on the top right hand photograph, one of those is unlocked and the other one is locked. It's sometimes very difficult to tell. They should all close in the same direction. On the left hand photo, you may just be able to make out the twist lock handles tucked behind the lashing bars. Are they locked or unlocked? If not, which one is open and which one's closed? Whoever lashed this one probably didn't take care, and by putting the lashing bar in place without checking, he's created a potential problem, particularly if this is in the lower tier of the stack, which it probably will be because of the lashing arrangement. To check the twist locks, the lashing has to be loosened again. Who has the time to allow that in this day and age? If the twist lock is loose, this can happen on the high seas. Here, damage to a container support stanchion, where the stanchion is now so badly bent and misaligned that there's no possibility of the right angle steel securing pin passing through the corner, case, sorry, the corner casing of the container. As a result, the container stack will not be properly secured to the deck. 
These are real examples. Loss overboard. Every year more than 10,000 containers fall overboard and spill their cargo into the ocean. That's a drop in the ocean, if you pardon the expression, compared to the 18 million containers in circulation. However, since it accounts for 16% of the total claims in value terms, it cannot be ignored. Our data suggests that it's a category of loss which could be reduced with improved practices. And you see on the left there, the highlighted section, these are the three main areas that need to be worked on. Again, the same, the usual suspects. Lashing, stowage, and also heavy containers on light. Adhering to straightforward stowage guidelines and the ship's own container securing manual would avoid this sort of misalignment, for example. We've got dislocated stacks here. Often, however, corners are cut and there's often commercial pressure to face which puts everybody under pressure. The master should, however, remember that he has the ultimate discretion. As I was saying, heavy on light can cause all sorts of problems, mainly compression and racking. In extreme cases, an entire stack will collapse with damage and loss of containers and their contents. That's racking, slightly different. Heavy on light, container weights. On the subject of container weights, uh, the UK's Marine Accident Investigation Bureau findings in the wake of the MSC Napoli incident are extremely interesting. None of the containers were weighed prior to loading. So the only weight information av available was in the shipper's declarations. <coughs> All the containers were opened and inspected after the incident. The dry ones were also weighed. That was about 660 containers. 20% of these had misdeclared weights. And the largest of those was a 20 ton discrepancy. So it's generally accepted, unfortunately, that there are container weight issues in the industry. It shouldn't be. I'm also going to look now quickly at hazardous cargoes before closing. So what is the problem? It's a problem which appears unfortunately to be on the rise and the trend is, is upwards with the transport of hazardous cargoes. As more and more diverse cargoes are being containerized, this may well continue. Uh, only yesterday uh, I was in Cyprus talking with a container ship operator who was telling me a, about a problem he was experiencing in South America at the very time. Uh, the problem was calcium hypochlorite, and you'll see in a, in a little while what kind of damage that can cause. The most serious risk is, of course, that the cargo destabilizes and that fire or explosion result. Unfortunately, when things go wrong, they can go badly wrong. Many of you may have seen this incident. Uh, it's close to home. And you may remember it, just off Crete, yes, that's right. Didn't sink two fatalities though, and um, in this day and age, that's a tough problem. Same year later on, the same year, not in Greece, on a voyage between the USA and Brazil, we had the DG Harmony. Total loss, the difference in, uh, in values at the time meant that that was a only 16 million dollars but still virtually all the cargo was destroyed and uh, as you can see a serious incident Hanjin, Pennsylvania this was our most expensive claim in 2002 again a fire following that an explosion a CTL costing 70 million plus dollars half the uh, containers on board were lost and Again, two fatalities. A few
few years later, the Hyundai Fortune, an even bigger claim than the Pennsylvania. But uh, as 2006 was a bad year for all the clubs, uh, it was not the worst claim we had that year. Nevertheless, a CTL and much of the cargo unsalvageable. The Hyundai Long Beach, um, a few years later, although there were no fatalities in this incident, it's interesting to note that the fire that started in hold number seven was in a container that was said to contain garments. It misdescribed. 263 containers damaged. More recently, just last year, we had the Charlotte Maersk. Very, uh, a very hot fire after the calcium hypochlorite reacted or destabilized. Although no uh, seamen were lost, as you can see, extensive damage, 150 containers uh, were, were damaged or lost, and the hatch covers of the ship, another expensive claim. I think I'm going to be out of time soon, but uh, just in summary, what we're looking to try and promote, if we can, across the industry, and, and it doesn't just involve ship owners, or indeed charterers, it's everybody who involves themselves with the containerized movements, accurate declaration of the contents and the weight, more precise uh, and detailed. The stowage of the goods within the container has to be looked at. The club produces a DVD called Any Fool Can Stuff a Container and we try to distribute that as much as possible through our, through our networks, not just in the ship owning sector but through the TT club that assure, ensures port liabilities and other um, mutuals, ITIC, which um, is, is an insurer of ship managers and small um, brokerages. We, we promote as much as possible the idea that it's not true that any fool can stuff a container. Securing the goods in the con inside the container, that's also very important. And again, that's covered in, in the DVD that, that we have and we circulate. The suitability of packaging is another area. Uh, of course, the ship and shore interface, that should be planned properly. And the equipment that's used should be suitable, easy to use, maintained well, and easy to maintain. I've only touching on the areas here. Really, I've only been able to scratch the surface. What is clear is that all the links in the chain need to pull together to improve standards so as to avoid claims. Clubs are well placed to facilitate that process. If you do want some more detail, the club does produce n not only these DVDs but other publications such as Container Lashing and Stowage and Container Matters. Uh, if you wish, you can obtain my card or come and speak to me afterwards and we can arrange for you to see those. Thank you very much.